Please give a warm welcome to you and Nilsa. Hello. Are you doing fine? Yeah. Are you doing fine, I asked. Yes. Perfect, great. Uh, when I was asked today to give this lecture, I was... Um, it's in Sweden, so uh, normally I do my lectures in English, but I asked if is this going to be in Swedish or not. Um, because it's interesting, like when I travel in Moscow or China, you know, I always have a person in a booth and he has a microphone and he has like a headset and people have headsets and they, t and they translate. But this time it was in China somewhere, I think it was outside of Shanghai, and Mr. Wu was going to be the translator. Fantastic. So, so I meet this Mr. Wu and he comes up to me and says, so where are you going to sit? No, I'm going to walk with you on stage. Okay, you're going to walk with me on stage. Okay, so I go on stage, and Mr. Wu goes next to me like a shadow. And I go, I said, I go left on the mountain. What should I so I, said, I go to right on the mountain. So like, and then I tell this joke, and it becomes a bit quiet. So I ask the guy, like, um, so how did you translate my joke? Oh, it was very difficult. I told audience, Mr. Nielsen told joke. Please laugh. <laughs> it's, um, it's a culture journey as long as a geographical journey is in an inner journey of your own mind. So what is impossible, and why do I do this? I mean, why do I spend, well, my ex-girlfriend did a calculation, 3,000 nights in a tent uh, the last, you know, 20, 25 years. Well, my family situation maybe isn't what it should. You know, I'm traveling the whole time. You know, I'm, I was in, a, you know, I was, I was in India uh, three, four weeks ago, uh, four or five days ago, I was in Serengeti. I'm traveling the whole time. So, what is this important, and why am I doing this? What, what is exploration? Well, exploration is not a geographical journey. It's an inner discovery of your own true potentials. Every time you push a limit, it's exploration. Evolution is a part of exploration. Every time you do something outside your comfort zone, you're a part of exploration. You change your patterns, it's exploration. It's a part of the everyday life, but you know, the more you travel, the more you see the world, the more you understand how important it is to push your limits, to break the patterns a little bit more. You see, every time I do these adventures all over the world, I break my patterns a little bit. I walk outside my comfort zone. It's to dare. It's to, you know, break your boundaries. It's to understand the life outside that comfort zone. And it's hard, it's tough, but it's worth it, and it's possible. So... Sometimes the inner journey and the geographical journey meet, especially in the beginning of 1900, when Amundsen and Scott and these guys were traveling all over the world. Well, Shackleton, he learned from Amundsen, who just reached the South Pole, that you can't just bring people you know, on this trip saying that, because he wanted to cross the whole freaking continent. But he learned from Amundsen that there are no good-looking girls in this place. There's no gold, no diamonds. So how do you get people on this trip? They get, they get no salary. And they probably don't get home alive. So how do you get people on this trip? Well, I can't lie to them, because then they, they, they won't join me. You know, and, or they will be you know, like a bad, com, you know, bad companion. So I have to be honest, but still I have to do it in a, like in a, a little, little tricky way. So put an ad, ad in the paper saying the following. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful but honor a recognition in case of success. <laughs> so you think anybody wanted to join this guy on this crazy trip without salary, no good-looking girls, no diamonds, no gold, no salary, telling the wife I might be home three to five years. If I come home alive, I probably won't have fingers and no salary. I'd be, I would be freaking broke. Thousands of people stood in line to be a part of this. Why? Because they're crazy? Because they're stupid? Because they want to be a part of evolution. They want to be a part of history. They want to be a part of something outside this comfort zone. See what will happen if you try. What will happen if you push your limits? Well, we all have our legends and our, our you know, role models. And I had a poster in my school. This was of Buzz Aldrin, the man on the moon. But he was like this legend. And, and I, I was Johan, you know, and there was no bridge in between. Then I got to know him many years later, and I started to understand, wait a minute, he was also a guy who had a dream. So I created something called the bridge. The bridge was an understanding between the start and the end. Because you see, when I grew up, I thought that people are born legend. Elton John is born Elton John. He was born Reginald Kenneth Dwight. He changed name to Elton John and he became Elton. 
Same with the Beatles, same with the football players. All these people, they started with a dream. And they had people around them saying, it's not possible. So when you grow up, you have dreams, you have visions, but you're also confused. So what are you going to do with all these dreams and this energy? What are you going to do with all this? Because you are not the legend. You are just you, but there is a bridge in between. And I started to see that more and more. But it was tricky because everybody kept saying the whole time, no, it's not possible. Why even try? It's not possible. And over and over again, I was seeing all these people, but what about all these people? What about all these people you know, who do all these things? What, ha- what did they you know, think about? And what did people tell them? So when I've been asking a lot of these guys you know, all over the world, all these big political leaders and artists, they all say the same thing. Everybody told them it's not possible. Everybody told them you cannot do this, you cannot do that. But they decided to go the other way. They decided to push the limits even further and see what happens. You might fail. You might also win. So going back in time, you know, when you see all these people, you start understanding that all these people, they are not here for a reason. They were fighting. They were fighting all the way, and they were fighting until they make it. Anybody recognize this one from school? I hated it, because you have to jump over it. And as a guy, it's even worse. But you can fall also, but I found a different solution. You can actually open this one, and you can hide inside it. <laughs> then nobody will pick you out for the football team. I was the worst in my football team. So when I was picking out people, I was the last person. That's not fun. It's better to hide inside it. Then nobody will see you. you of course, you will get the lowest grade in gymnastics, but that's better than being laughed at as a 10-year-old kid. So greatness, was that for other people? I was, you know, having lowest grade in gymnastics, being happy inside my, you know, know, big wooden horse. But still, I started to think more and more, like, you know, what happens if you try? What happens if you do something? So I was watching TV, and this guy was playing piano. I asked my mother, who is that? He he plays good. Well, he plays very, very well. Well, his name is Elton John. He plays the piano, you know. yeah, but, you know, it, it, he plays very well. Yeah, but I know, but, you know, so how can I become, you know, like Elton John? Well, practice, you know, be motivated, be focused. Can I become Elton John? Well, you might become Elton, you won, but at least you will try. And if I fail, I just try again. So I made a bet with myself. Within three years, somebody would pay me to play the piano. I was insane, and I didn't even tell anybody because it was so stupid that I didn't, you know, I, I know what it is to be laughed at, and this would really be a laughing issue. So I was sitting there three years later, and somebody was paying me to play the piano. And I realized that if you, if you try hard enough, you will reach somewhere. And the problem, you know, the hard thing is not to reach your goals. The hard thing is to know what they are and focus on one thing. I've never done that before. So I was sitting there playing the piano at the old nightclub called Alexandra, and then I was working at the Grand Hotel, and I was sitting playing the piano down in Cannes, in Monaco, I was traveling the world playing the piano. And I was shocked, like, you know, something that was impossible is not possible, and somebody's paying me to do that. What else is possible? So I was sitting at the Grand Hotel playing the piano, saying to my friends, it's amazing with this focusing and motivation and practicing, you can just do whatever you want to. Well, you happen to have an ear for music, you can't just put this in a different context. You can't just become a rocket scientist or whatever, or like you know, a football player just because you want to. Well, I can do whatever I want to. Yeah, but something physical you can't do because you were the worst in the football team. <laughs> well, I can you know, jump on my bike and bike to Gothenburg if I feel like. And they were laughing. <laughs> Listen, you won't make it out of Stockholm. So we made a bet. I would bike to the Sahara the week after. Um, <laughs> the, the problem was I didn't have a bike. Um, my mother told me there are more problems than that. Um, so I was starting to bike. I threw up the first day in a place called Södertälje. Yeah, I can assure you, it's very close to Stockholm. It was the worst thing I've ever done in my entire life. But I didn't want to give up because I know what it was to give up, you know, and hide behind that wooden horse. So I continued and continued. And the first thing was that, how do I find my way out of Stockholm? Grand Hotel, uh, which way? Södertälje is that way. That must be the way to Africa. You know, asking my way down. After 52 days, I was sitting there in Africa, I said, fuck, this worked. I'm in Africa, what happened? I didn't give up. Every day I continued, continued more and more. I came home being shocked again. Well, this worked. Impossible became possible through doing it. What else is possible? 
So I was looking back in books and things, like all these people that I've been reading about, you create your own future. They actually change the history by doing something that nobody's ever done before. Can I also do something? Or is that meant for others? Is greatness for other people? Or is it also for me? Going out in space, why even try? Go back 1,000 years, say, I'm going to go out in space. It will cut your head off. But then one, get, one, one guy, he did it. You know, and he came out in space, you know, Russian guy, and impossible became possible through doing it. Running faster than 10 seconds, the other people, you know, in 100 meters, they wouldn't even try because it is impossible. Why try something that's not possible? Well, one guy did an impossible again, became possible through doing it. Over and over again, in medicine, in innovations, in politics, and cultures, and laws, everything, things that were impossible became possible through doing it. Even Mr. Gates said that 64K is maximum what we'll use in a lifetime. <laughs> Sorry, Bill, but I have 10 terabytes at home. <laughs> and this is just my lifetime. What happens in one million years? What happened in 100, 200 years back? What will happen in the future? How can I create my own future. Well, I was very curious, you know, and my favorite, you know, example is this woman. She was having cakes and coffee every birthday for her whole life. She was living in Mississippi somewhere. And she was thinking, like, coffee and cakes and, you know, biscuits every year. I want to do something different. I must warn you that the jump from coffee and cookies uh, to go down Niagara Falls uh, is a big jump. <laughs> As the first woman ever in the beginning of 1900. I must give the, uh, the woman also, uh, who calls herself Queen of the Mist, some credibility for choosing a hat. Because first thing you do when you're going to go down the Niagara Falls as a woman turning 63 is what hat should I also pick? <laughs> also, I must say that this woman might also be in the Guinness Book of Records for having the most scared cat ever existed. Um, so now going down time, you know, I was standing here and having all the world in front of me, you know, the world that was in my hands. What else can I do? What else is possible? I was curious and I was starting to look at the map and I want to see the world, I want to do things. So what if I fail? What if I don't make it? Well, I can try again and again and again, but at least I will know what I did wrong and I will learn from it. I knew that well. So I wanted actually to try something that, you know, nobody's ever done before, uh, but I said, well, before I do that, it's better to try things that I have never done before, at least, so I know what that is. Because if you go back in time, if you fail, I mean, we're not here today because of 4.5, 6, 7 billion years of, you know, good things that's happened. We're here because of the, the failures. And we're here because of people have turned a different route and did something different. And then we're here today. So I know that if you just push your limits, you will make it. So I wanted to climb Mount McKinley, the Gnarly, the highest mountain in North America, also called the coldest mountain in the world. One little slight problem I had never climbed before. Um, I understood that was a problem. Um, so I was thinking like, you know, okay, so what shall I do? Okay, first of all, I'm going to call up the best climbers in Sweden with one single question. What mistakes have you done? Not what do you recommend. I can read about that in books. What is your biggest failure? And that became my biggest knowledge on the mountain. Because, you know, there's a lot of people using also mistakes as knowledge. I mean, you know, one guy, he went the other direction, you know? And, uh, you know, he wanted to go to India, went to U.S. instead. But he made something good out of that also. So at least you can try. But what if you fail? Over and over again, people told me that this is not possible, you can't do this, you can't do that. I created something called the wall philosophy. The wall philosophy is built on a brick wall, where I ask you, for example, can I walk through brick wall? I'm made of flesh and bone. I'm made of, you know, this is made of stone. Well, the obvious answer might be, of course, you can walk through brick wall if it's, it's made of stone. My answer is a bit different. My answer is, I don't know how to do it. But just because I don't know how to do it doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means that I don't have the knowledge. If I would show an iPhone in the 13th century, they'd probably burn me alive. If I would show electricity in the Stone Age, they think that I'm God. Maybe in 10,000 years, we can walk through brick wall. Maybe we can never do that. But that's not the point. The point is, I don't know. So it's, every time I run into a problem, I understand that just because I don't know how it works doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means that I don't know how it works. I mean, Slatan is playing TV live in my phone from Australia. How is that possible? I have no idea. Still, 
it's, it's the reality. I don't understand it. That doesn't mean it's not the reality. It just means that I don't understand it. So every time I run into a problem, I know there's a solution. And that mind-opening moment was very annoying because it was easier to think it's impossible, don't even care about it. Now I know everything is possible. And I'm just trying to find solutions. You know, normally I do like two, three days talks. You know, I do weekends and everything. So I have 45 minutes now. So, so um, 45 minutes I've calculated during my expeditions. That's 67 days per minute. Um, so I have to like, you know, shorten them. So I asked my mother and my father, so what should I talk about? Well, you have to talk about when you were living with the cannibal tribes in Papua New Guinea. You know, I'm having a friend for dinner. It's got a new meaning. Um, and then my mother said, yeah, well, that's interesting, you know, of course, but, you know, you can't, you know, miss, you know, the 8,000 meter without oxygen in the Himalaya in the beginning of the 90s, or even when you were living, you know, in this little hut in, you know, in Antarctica, doing, you know, films about, you know, uh, science and the climate change. And my brother came in, yeah, but, you know, but still think, I think the dogs are interesting, or across the Arctic, or... 4,800 meters rock climbing in Indonesia, or you know, even make it a little bit easier. Summit of Europe in Russia, that's an interesting trip. My father came in, it might be, but does it have to be so physical? Take the Northwest Passage with the ice break. You did films for climate change for Discovery Channel, or even when you were walking across Alaska, or living with the apes in Borneo. Those are fantastic expeditions. My mother came in and said, might be, but you know, don't forget the kayak from Grand Hotel in Stockholm to Africa. That's a fantastic journey. <laughs> or even climbing, you know, the highest mountain in South America. My brother came in, yes, be so it, but don't forget about jet ski over the Atlantic. Um, <laughs> A, a stupid, stupid journey. Uh, you know, all these expeditions that I've been on, even if it's like climbing the highest mountain of Antarctica or even 1,700 kilometers south and north over Greenland, it's all based on the same thing. Everybody had people knocking my shoulder and saying, hey, you know, don't even try, it's impossible. Interesting. Why is it impossible? Oh, because nobody's ever done it. Interesting. So why even try? You know, this invisible wall that was ahead of me the whole time. And I was standing with my knife, trying to open it the whole time. But people were like, you know, with the stitches and sewing it together again, saying that don't go through. Why? It's so irritating. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, you know, a journey that is never stopping the whole time. And I'm sitting here in this box trying to get out, you know, and trying to find ways the whole time to really fight my way through this. But, you know, people came up to me and said, like, you know, okay, fine, you were, you know, you were doing this bike to Africa, but don't kayak to Africa. It's a long way. <laughs> okay, interesting. So how long will it take? I have no idea. It took six months. Uh, 2.7 million strokes with the, uh, with, the, with the paddle. Came to, to a little city on the border of Holland and, and Germany, and they closed the lock system. If anybody wants to kayak to Africa, I can tell you, it's 410 locks. Um, you have to pass by. But then, then they closed the whole system, and I asked some workers, like, how do I, you know, kayak through the city? You know, it's, um, it's no water in the lock. <laughs> the guy's looking at me. Well, there's no water in the lock. I know, so how do I kayak through the city? I just told you there's no water in the... He thinks I'm stupid. There's no water in the lock. Yeah, but how do I kayak through the city? Well, obviously, it's, it's impossible. So what if it was possible? What do you mean? But what if, let's say that it was possible. Do, do some Peter Pan, think happy thoughts. What if it was possible? <laughs> well, if it was possible, which is not, but if it was possible, I guess I would have chosen the sewer system under the city. Fine. So I call up the fire department, take down the kayak in the sewer. I did not smell raspberry. Uh, and Going out on the other side, this man is standing there looking at me, shaking his head, you know, and I point at him and say, you see, it was possible. Yeah, if you think like that. <laughs> exactly. If you think like that. So Nat Geo is calling me up now saying that, listen, we want to follow this journey. We want to make this documentary about you, about your trips to Africa. We don't get the last one. You're doing your kayak, you're doing your bike. What do you mean the last one is with the boat? It's with the boat. What do you mean that it's flying? Let me introduce to you the flying boat from Sweden to Africa. Fly me to the moon. Let me play up there with those stars. 
Let me see what I can life assure you, everything that happened, I make a list. Things that will happen when you fly a boat to Africa. Everything happened, but there was a new list also. Things that I didn't expect. So coming down, you know, through Sweden and through all these things, you know, we have to fly every day up and down, a support car with fuel, everything. I'm coming down to Engelholm, the southern part of Sweden, and I'm, you know, flying around there with my rubber dinghy, and um, I hear them, like, you know, the control from Copenhagen is, you know, addressing me, saying that Sierra Echo Victor Charlie Zulu, that's my, that's my private jet, uh, like, um, can you stay in something we call in Sweden, in Sweden, Ventvarv? It's, it's like an area you, went, you wait between like four points at 1,700 feet. I was normally flying at 2,000, but I can go down a little bit for like, you know, the sake of it. So I go down to 1,700 feet, I'm circling around there, and I just like, you know, feel something like vibrating in the air. And I'm peeing my pants. I'm like, what is this? The whole freaking boat is just moving. Then I look down, and I see four SK-65 jets flying under me, and, and, you know, and I hear them, I hear them on the control, you know, I hear them on the control, like, you know, uh, Copenhagen control, we have a situation, uh, it's a boat here, uh, uh, don't go so low, it's summer season, a lot of, you know, sailboats, uh, the boat is above us, uh, would you like to report UFO? You know, all the time, back and forth, when you do these expeditions, you meet all kind of like interesting cultures, interesting people. I wanted to do something now, pushing the limits even more. I wanted to climb the highest mountain on all the seven continents around the world, called the Seven Summits. Um, that was going to be a long trip, I understood that. Um, and one guy, one lecture, he raised his hand and said, listen, Johan, um, can I just, you know, interrupt you for a second? Of course. Isn't it pretty convenient that all these mountains are so close to each other? So I just want to say, um, it's a graphic. It's a graphic. I just want to say that the, the seven continents is not in one row, you know? <laughs> Highest, of course, is um, Mount Everest. 8,848,000 8, billion trillion meters, because it's much higher than what it actually is. That's what it feels like every step you walk up. My father said, like, yeah, but you walk up, you walk down. Why does it take so long time? Well, the thing is that... <laughs> You know, you walk up from base camp. Wait a minute, how do you get to, to base camp? Well, you have to walk from 1,800 meters down in the valley for three, four weeks up to the base camp, and then up to camp one, camp two, camp three, down camp one. So you climb the mountain like seven times before you actually climb the mountain. Why? Because it's so fun. Well, you have to climatize. You have to build up the camps along the way. And this is kind of the route, what it looks like. And this is the moment when I realized I'm a little bit afraid of heights. Uh, <laughs> It might not be the right moment. So, because, you know, falling off this ladder is, is very, very negative, you know? So you, so, so you don't want to do that, especially when it's 400 of these ladders you have to pass back and forward for two months. And your, your cooked spaghetti legs are getting worse and worse for every day. So you're balancing with your 25 kilos backpack, and you don't want to fall, as I said, it's very negative, you know? So you're trying to get to the other side, and other side and other side, back and forward the whole time through this ice fall, up and down until you reach camp three, camp four, and then you're hitting for the summit. But the thing is that obstacles, opportunities in disguise. Every time you run into problems, there's always a solution, but there's also knowledge, because all these things that you learn the whole time, you can bring with you until the next climb. So every time I run, oh, that was very stupid, that was very wrong, let's remember that one. Instead of saying that, oh, that was a failure, that is so bad. But sometimes you have to push your limits to know where the limits are. You know, I was climbing um, Aconcagua the first time in 2003. And I come up to the summit, and closer and closer, I have to turn around. Black clouds come coming in. Walking down, I can tell you, it's not fun to turn around after one month of climbing. Crying all the way down, meeting some media at the airport at Arlanda. Um, you have failed. How does it feel? Um, <laughs> No, I haven't failed. Yes, we were following your blog. You turned around before the summit. That's correct. So you have failed. No, no, no. I just postponed the success until next year. What do you mean by that? Well, as long as I keep on trying, you can never say that I failed, right? The moment I quit, the moment I stop, that's the moment when I fail. But as long as I never, ever give up, I'm just in the process of succeeding. Because the thing is that... I don't mind. I don't mind turning around. I do mind dying. It would be so boring. 
So going up and down the, again, you know, it's, I brought this with me to, to the mountain, I mean to the big mountain, to, to Everest. Because the biggest mistake we can do in life is not daring to do mistakes. You cannot reach any summit in business, personal life, or anything without taking some kind of risk. But it has to be calculated. So coming up the last part, I was walking, you know, very slowly, very slowly, this mantra, Everest, Everest, Everest. If I stop now, I'll die. If I sit down, it's minus 50. I've been walking now for like six, seven weeks. I'm dead tired. If I sit down, I will probably die. So I renamed the mountain. So from now on, I called it instead Mount Neverest. So that was my way, <laughs> that was my way of reaching the summit and, you know, to be able to make it up. But then come a big shock. You know, if you run a marathon, or you do the Vasa, for example, the ski race, you come, to, like, you, this girl is giving you some kind of, you know, uh, some medal, you get some blueberry soup, you're very happy, you get a diploma, but you don't have to run backwards naked with somebody on your shoulders in a storm. Because you see, the summit of Everest is just halfway. Then you have to walk all the way down again. Oh, uh, you didn't think about that, right? Well, I did. So I was trying to focus everything coming up to the summit. This is not the summit. I have to come down alive. So coming down alive, that's when you have climbed the mountain. Coming down again, you know, and um, you know, one guy, one lecturer also said, like, I would love to climb Everest. Oh, fantastic. I was, being, I was starting to explain what it, you know, what it means. Uh, I mean, what I mean, what I mean? Raising the money, training, two months, risking your life, frostbite. No, 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 no. But I love that summit shot. Yeah, but there's no shortcut to the summit. There's no shortcut to the summit of Everest. It's hard work, but it's worth it and it's possible. Because you see, when you reach the summit, then you realize that you have reached something by yourself. And those feelings of reaching your goals in life are. It's just amazing. You know, I'm, I'm working with a lot of NGOs, and I've been ambassador for eight years for one called Mistura Da, it's a Make-A-Wish Foundation. And I brought teddy bears up from, from hospitals all over Sweden with the children with cancer, and I brought them back and I gave lectures around the schools to bring back the teddy bears from the summit of the world, showing what is possible. But possible, it's very interesting, because people say that, oh my God, it's so difficult, it's impossible. No, 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 difficult, yes, impossible, no. And remember this, it's very, very important. Just because things are difficult doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means that you are not willing to take the risk, you don't have the knowledge, you're not willing to do the effort to reach that goal. But it's not impossible. As I said in the world philosophy, nothing is impossible. It just means that I don't know how to do it. But it's very difficult. And when you come up to the summit, you know, you come down again, they call me Mr. Lobster. And I had Sun Protection 50, I still have no idea why, maybe you guys can figure out. But <laughs> traveling around the world, asking people regarding dreams and goals, it's very interesting because it turns out to be a very big difference between goals and dreams. If you look at, at goals, goals is something within your comfort zone you know you can reach. Dreams is something for other people. Other people reach dreams. And you look up to other people, my God, it's so cool, he reached that dream, I'm going to stay within this circle reaching my goals. But the thing is that, date the dream. If you walk outside this, this circle, if you walk outside this circle, this comfort zone, you can reach those dreams. Just put a date to it. Just put a deadline on it and work your way backwards. Date the dream, it's possible, but it's hard, but it's possible. So I wanted to put everything together now. All my expeditions is like 20 years, in one expedition, the most extreme I could think about, also in terms of history, going from the North Pole to the South Pole. Well, that would be a long journey, I understood that. I knew I was not starting outside the Grand Hotel this time. Um, but the thing is that when you start on the North Pole, it's very interesting, because normally you, you, know, you go that direction, or that direction, or that direction. If you're stupid enough to uh, you know, fly a boat, maybe you go that direction. But you never go that direction. So standing on the North Pole, okay, let's start. I'm going to go to that side of the apple. Um, I had a Norwegian guy with me, Harald, who was stupid enough to go with me, as they say afterwards. And then we were standing there. Nobody, none of us had been to North Pole before. And NASA is saying now the worst ice condition ever measured in history is right here, right now, when you are going to do it. Huh, fine. We have these pictures we downloaded, got some from people, this beautiful picture. How can it be so bad, you know? North Pole, you know, just, we have 130 kilo sled, of course, that's very heavy. 
we drag it, it's minus 50, we have the gear, fine, okay. Um, but the thing is that when we came to the North Pole, I don't know who's ahead of like, you know, the tourist brochures, but, but, but I'm going to sue them, because it was not really what, you know, what happened when I came to the North Pole. Dragging the sled in, in this was not what I signed up for. <laughs> Every day for 60 days. And in, in it's minus 40, minus 50, minus 27, 29 inside the tent. So I ask um, Harald, can you, can you just please go up this iceberg there and see if it looks better over there? Uh, no, not really. But over there, uh, not really. So we walk back and forward, back and forward the whole time, trying to drag this sled. And my knee was getting worse and worse for every day. You know, if I do Mount Everest, for example, I start in Stockholm. I fly really nice plane to Kathmandu, walk for three weeks up to Lukla in shorts and t-shirt. And then I'm there for a week, you know, I'm going up slowly, slowly the mountain. Of course, it's a nightmare, the last part, but I'm gradually, you know, going up North Pole. They come in with a Russian shopper, just drop me off, <laughs> bang, bye. Take off, I'm standing there, polar bears, minus 50, cracked ice, what am I going to do now? But the thing is that, over and over again, people saying that, oh, you know, you're crazy, you're crazy, you're crazy. Even Spain calling me Elvi Kingo Loco. They have a whole series of hundreds of articles about me with the sign Elvi Kingo Loco. The question is, are you crazy just because you want to fulfill your dreams in life? Are you crazy just because you have ideas that you might not understand? You have dreams that I don't understand. Doesn't mean they're wrong. I have dreams you will never understand. It doesn't mean that I'm wrong. It just means it's individual. And we all have our dreams. We should support each other in these dreams. We should tell each other, that dream is for you. I will support you in that decision. I don't understand it. That's not the point. I should not understand it. It's not important. The important is we should actually try to help each other in these dreams. So, you know, taking a deep breath, you know, and trying to figure out what are we going to do. First of all, we have to do distance. 20 kilometers per day. So we made 20 kilometers, pushing the limits as far as we can. I'm bleeding in my toes, my fingers, I have frostbites all over. My knee is very bad, but we made 20 kilometers. Put up the tent. Where do you put up the tent? So we're like looking for two hours, put up the tent. Put up the freaking tent, go to bed, go to sleep, lying there almost crying, so dead tired, waking up next morning, finally, we're going to go next day, we made 20 kilometers, nobody can take that away from us, except planet Earth. So, during the night, we have been drifting backwards to the same position as we started the day before. I can tell you, the motivation now is to move on, not being dragged backwards. So we created something called NOX. NOX stands for no excuses. I can tell you, you have a lot of excuses inside the tent every morning getting up, trying to put up the gear, melting snow for two hours, and then going out in minus 50 and work your way every day, every day for 60 days. You have a lot of excuses not to go the next day. But if you're getting dragged backwards, I can tell you that's the motivation. And sometimes even, you know, it's being cracked. We have to crawl over these open leads. We have to fight our way, you know, and jump over them, sometimes it's that bad, so we have survival suits. And we put on the survival suits on the North Pole, and we swim around to the other side. Sometimes 100 meters, 200 meters, 50 meters, back and forward the whole time, trying to, you know, fight our way the whole time. So, you know, it's really something that you should think about, you know, when you have goals that are really hard, to push the limits even further, see how far you can go. So, NASA has a saying that failure is not an option, but failure must be an option, but fear must not. You must push your limits, you must dare. So when you, you see, I'm on these places, when I'm walking away here, you know, being, I, I don't feel as you know, motivated here, but I know that I can make it. I know that I can make it if I push my limits even, 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 even further. So, traveling around the world like, like this has brought me to one understanding is that everything is possible. The impossible just takes a little bit more time. Thank you very much.